Well, I'd like to welcome everybody back to uh, my meditation uh, classes, I guess. <laughs> this one is called Ending the Self, Secrets of the Buddha Mind. And I know when I first um, heard the term ending the self, this was something that confused me quite a bit because I didn't know what else I would be if it wasn't me, right? <laughs> so I, I didn't understand why or how I could ever get rid of myself. But it turns out that Ending the self is a very important part or process that needs to take place, right? Think of each each way of thinking as a knot in a way, right? And if that way of thinking is too narrow, then that knot is restricting the true self, right? The true self is in a knot that is restricting it. And when we undo that knot, the restriction is gone, right? Our true self is expo exposes itself in a way, right? So, untying the knot of this understanding of self is very, very important. It leads to a higher state of mind. But originally, the search or understanding of self, the Buddha's understanding of self, came from an earlier understanding. And this was one that I did not understand at all when I first heard it. That teaching was only good for some things <laughs> and, I was, and my teacher told me that i was like um i don't understand that i mean excuse me because and where i came from and where you probably come from <laughs> teaching seems pretty pretty handy right because how can we learn anything unless there's somebody teaching it or how can we pass our information on to somebody else unless we're teaching it right so teaching seems to have a lot of value, unlimited value in, in our, my mind, right? But the Buddhist teachers, my teacher would say, no, <laughs> teaching has a limited value, right? And he says, you know, the Buddha began to wonder about this himself. And that when the Buddha was young, he did not simply stumble upon his way of thinking, but that he was a teacher and he was a student first, of course. And that he learned at least two schools of yoga, became a proficient teacher. Um, and that he left those schools of teaching. The, you know, the history says that he was an aesthetic, that he uh, limited his food intake very, very much. Uh, basically abused himself physically <laughs> to find enlightenment. Um, and nearly killed himself from his dedication to this way of thinking, right? And, you know, at some point, the Buddha began in his meditations to understand something. That despite these wonderful teachers, these wonderful intentions, these wonderful teachings, the dedication of students, years of practice, that not one single enlightened one had stepped forward in the way that he wished to be enlightened. And he wished to be enlightened with the Atman mind, which is the godlike mind, right? The God mind. He wanted to think without the filter of human distortion. <laughs> and he believed that was available to him. So, you know, I imagine at first that's the reason why he kept changing teachers and changing teachings was at first he suspected it was it was the teacher. Or maybe it was the teaching. But after a while, I began to realize, no, it was not the teacher or the teaching. These ones worked very difficult, or, you know, worked very hard to understand. These ones were very dedicated, as were all the students. The teachings were trying to reflect truth in the best way possible. And that there were some very good hearts involved here. And he began to wonder if maybe it was the act of teaching itself was that was the problem. And he probably felt the same way that you and I feel, like, how could you learn if you couldn't be taught? How could you not take teaching away and still be an understandable guy, right? These are things he had to think about, right? But he began to realize that teaching always created a path. And just like a real path through a field, it's the most efficient way through the field, making all the other parts of the field the most inefficient way. And so now the path becomes in conflict with the field, right? 
if we were to walk through the field, the fi or those walking through the field would be fools or foolish, right? Because the efficient way was to walk on the path. So we would be in conflict with those who were field walkers in a sense, right? So the teaching always creates a path with always creates conflict with those things that do not believe in the path or are also forming other paths, right? Teaching cannot find contentment because the act of teaching itself creates conflict. So there was a problem there now, right? You can't find contentment through teachings. And the more he looked at it, he began to realize that really, other than encouragement, all talk was a form of discontentment, really. And that those who were truly content would be silent. Not silence from being shut up, but silence from contentment. That only the content, the discontent were talking. Only the discontent were looking to be taught, right? Right? And only the, the, the teachers were teaching a form of teaching because they were discontent with the other teachings around them. So the teachings themselves came from discontentment, right? So they were all acts that were taking place on the same mental level, right? The same level. Talking, teaching, and discontentment was a level of thinking that once trapped in, you would never be in a place of contentment ever again. You could not find it there. You would have to look in a different way. <laughs> So what do you look at? What do you listen to if you can't listen to the words? Because the words are always discontentment. The talk is always a narrow path in a world you want to live in a wide way, right? So you can't you can't use these words and thinkings to act, right? What do you do? Well, the Buddha began to look through the words in a way. He would listen to the words and understand them. But he would look deeper into the individual, into what was causing those words. And he began to see something. He began to see something very beautiful. He began to see the beauty of their worrisome nature. He began to see their sensitivity and how they felt, you know, how, how, how they felt that things were so wrong in the world. And that was what was causing all the problems that they were having, all their anxiety causing all their actions which were narrow thinking and vicious, sometimes violent. But it was all being fueled by love, conscious love, right? <laughs> not getting its way, not understood, not understanding, but it was fueled by love. And he could see the beauty of it all, right? And he could see that this beauty was not just in the people. But it was also in the animals, all loving, all beautiful, when not hungry, when not under the foot of a human, <laughs> when not being tortured or hunted, right? That living in their own environment in a proper numbers and without, you know, with territory, they live a peaceful, happy life. They're beautiful beings, right? And then the Buddha would look at the stones themselves and he would say, that these things are conscious because they're made from conscious love. But even if you don't believe that, they're only a mere moment away from being human, <laughs> he would say. <laughs> Why? Because he says, you know, a stone can be ground into mineral and that mineral can be picked up by the water and taken in by a plant in just a few days, a few moments, right? And very soon that mineral becomes plant, right? And then the plant is picked up by a human and mixed in a salad and eaten with a rabbit or whatever you can have with, right? And he says very soon both the rabbit and the plant are human, right? Human consciousness, right? Is now acting upon the same flesh that was made from a rabbit, that was made from a plant and a mineral, right? So he began to show love to all these things as his brothers and sisters because they were only a mere few steps away from being his actual brothers and sisters. And in fact, he felt they were always that way, right? 
So he began to see the love in all things. But he also began to see how powerful that love was and how scattered it had become on this planet. How scattered it had become in the in the human consciousness, right? Thousand thoughts, all loving different things, fighting each other. This is the mind of humanity. This is the mind of you and I, right? Love, scattered, fighting against itself. Small-minded, right? Usually, small-minded because it's following teaching, <laughs> following an event, right? You know, wanting to repeat the past or wanting to avoid the past, right? Small thinking, right? But love, love. So the Buddha began to say, what is this love? <laughs> what is this love that is so easily distorted and turned into violence <laughs> when it's on its earthly journey? Look at it. It's a mess, right? And how could each man be exactly the same love? Right? Although they are uniquely showing that love based on their own previous or their own life experiences, they're all filled full of love. Disturbed love, angered love, right? Jealous love, but love. And he began to see that really all consciousness was the same consciousness. Right? that it was all conscious love. And he began to see the oneness of which he was a part of. He, and he began to see that we were all extensions, extensions of one consciousness. And for that reason, he knew that he was not only the Buddha, but he was also the pillow the Buddha sat upon. He was also the ground that the pillow sat upon. He was also the people who were listening to him, and he was the he he was all things, right? And for that reason, he loved all things equally, right? and that's when the Buddha mind formed, right? Because he had a true reason for loving all things equally, because he now understood that this was his true self. Human self had disappeared, and with it, human worry, human concern. <laughs> right? He was the he was the conscious universe. He wasn't worried whether he would live or die. He wasn't worried whether he was going to get cancer next year. He knew he was the conscious universe. That he was on multiple experiences at the same time. He did not question whether he would ever come back. He was all things. He would be here in another way already. He was already here in another way already. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a different way of thinking, but it released him from his human thinking. It released him from his human worries, which were just narrow, narrowing his love. Right? So he began a journey of a million journeys simultaneously. And for that reason, he let his earthly understanding go in favor of what he truly was, the conscious universe itself, only seeing through the eyes of a man. It's no different than a plant, right? Imagine leaves became self-aware and all thought that they were living separate lives, <laughs> just like humans, right? And what if one of the leaves said, you know, I, I just kind of wondered that maybe that's just a way of thinking and maybe we're the tree. You know, all the other leaves would have laughed at him. No, 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 we only live one season. This is, you know, this is it, you know? And he kept, but he, he realized that, no, no, maybe maybe he was just conscious from the, the perspective of the leaf but that he was actually the whole everything that surrounded him all the other leaves all the other branches the trunk even the roots he had never seen and that he was actually hundreds of feet long and thousands of pounds of energy that were surrounding him was actually his energy or the tree's energy but that he was not a leaf he was the tree <laughs> and he was not only doing leaf things but he was also doing tree things and he was doing root things and doing many many things that he couldn't even feel but they were all aspects of what he truly was you know it wouldn't have affected his life a great deal as a leaf but he was probably the only one who didn't fear falling off in the fall because he knew that he was the actual tree and that his consciousness would be stored in that tree all the other leaves spent their whole lives worrying that they were leaves and that they were fighting amongst each other for light and they were fighting amongst each other for rain 
not knowing that the leaf next to him was giving him his health as well, right? Because that leaf was attached to the same tree he was, right? But he was small-minded. And that small-mindedness, that small understanding of the self was a knot that needed to be untied, right? So the Buddha had done this, and this is what had led to this awakening. And this all came from his thinking that maybe teaching was only a limited way of understanding. Right? That thinking was really for forming choices in the material world. Thinking was for creating conflict. Choosing one thing over another. And that's all it was for. Right? So it was good for choosing one food over another, one maid over the other, one place to live over the other. But once your physical needs were done, thinking was was of no value, right? That at that point we loved all things and we simply encouraged all things, right? What need was there to choose one thing over another? That this was a limited way of thinking, only good for food gathering, only good for finding a mate, finding a place to live. So he put that way of thinking aside early, right? He only ate once a day, he lived on the floor, a homeless man. But he had accomplished what no man had done by awakening the Atman mind. Right? Because he began to realize that contentment did not come from thinking. It came from understanding who he truly was. So that his confidence was so great, he would not have human worry any longer. It would simply be something childlike to him. The childlike worry of death. The childlike worry of our legacy, <laughs> the childlike worry of our purpose in life. Our purpose is to live simple. Our purpose is to encourage others. Our purpose is to care for the planet. Right? Because we are much greater than this one lifetime. And we must make investments in all, all of our future lifetimes by caring for all that we are. Not just this simple version of what we are. But all versions of what we are, all people, all neighbors, all things, right, to care for them equally. And can you imagine a world where all people did that? <laughs> it would end all things, right, <laughs> to be that loving and that caring. And yet it simply comes from understanding what we are. Right? So anyways, that's the lesson for today. And I hope that you have enjoyed it. Uh, any questions, feel free to leave them uh, on, on the notes and that, and subscribe if you like. I'll try to make a few more lessons here and there. <laughs> Sometimes I get kind of quiet, but uh, I do thank you, and I love you all, and namaste. Love you.